Welcome to Everything Life Coaching. I'm John Kim. And I'm Noelle Cordeau. We are the founders of Lumia. And we're super passionate about all things coaching, and we want to share what we've learned from over a decade of coaching and training thousands of life coaches. Let's dive into the science and magic of coaching. On today's episode, we are going to tackle the importance of learning and change as an adult. Noel, before we start, I want to show you something. This is what most people call me. I don't know if you agree. I have a mug and it says Little Miss Chatterbox. I am John. You're kind of the, the stoic type for me. Yeah, that's true. I'm very, I'm very chatty when there's a phone in front of my face or a microphone, but in person, I am more introverted and quiet. And, uh, you know, they, they call it resting bitch face. Oh, yeah, I, I have, have that, that too. I, I have oh, that yeah. too. So, yeah, people don't like me in person. Anyway. Well, we're, we're good to be. I don't, you know what? I don't think that it's people don't like you in person, but there's a certain expectation of who you are based on how you show up online. And yeah, the, the, it's, it's the, really fascinating. The introverted side of you is, is likely surprising to folks. Yes, that's what it is, you know. They see me uh, spinning on my head on the on the camera, so they think I'm going to be like jokester, warm, big hugs, and then I'm very quiet and pensive, and they're like, "Oh, strange." Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't match up. This is called false advertising on the internet, everyone. Anyway, yeah, it just takes a minute to get to know you, and then you'll you'll spin on your head all day. You know, it's <laughs> yeah, especially if you have a roommate bringing K-pop stars to dinner. But anyway, that's a that's a different conversation. Okay, it's a good story. Yeah. The importance of learning and change as an adult. Yes. So here we are. And why are we talking about this? Why are we talking about this in in the context of coaching? And the premise I kind of want to just drop here is that people are complex. The world is messy and no one is happy with the status quo. How do you see the world right now? Mm, Yes. The world right now, I know a lot of people are uncomfortable. There's a lot of change happening. And also there's stuff happening for me as well, right? So when I pull back and look at the world, I think there's a pendulum swinging. I think there's rocks being turned over. I think there's a lot of people that are being shaken because old blueprints are being torn down. There's a lot of feminine energy because in the last, I would say, 100 years, it was on Mask is so there's just a lot of stuff happening and there's a lot of resistance. There's a lot with anything with change, there's always going to be resistance. So the world is, uh, I mean, everyone's saying it, the world is crazy. I don't think it's crazy. I just think, uh, we're evolving, growing and there's a shakeup. It's, it's, um, getting a lot of people activated for sure. Absolutely. And, and I think, you know, too, it's the ever interconnectedness and visibility that we have that has, that is really contributing to the way people are experiencing the world. And so bridging the divide now over to coaching, a very simple assumption about coaching is that the purpose of it is ultimately to change one's behavior. And in fact, coaching really boils down to one question. If you're not happy with the status quo, what are you going to do differently? I love that that question is... um... It's lined with action, right? So coaching being about, um, like you said, moving the needle, how can we change our life? What are your goals? Instead of just holding space, instead of something that can fall into you know, the therapy world. Oh, yeah. The therapy world would be asking, you know, how do you feel about mm-hmm. the status quo? And right, then coaching right. asks you, well, what are you going to do about it? Right. And, right. I, you know, that's that's a important and fundamental difference. And you're right. The This question holds action and it also holds future vision, which I think is so absolutely hopeful because a lot of people can tell you what they want, but they have no clue to get there. And so coaching actually helps you connect the dots between what you need to learn, what you need to do, and what steps you need to take to actually move into the future. Yeah, I love that. Uh, That was a very simple but powerful distinction between um, coaching and therapy. Yeah. So learning is implicit in this process. And 
if you're going to change, if you're going to grow, if you're going to do things differently, oftentimes you have to learn. You have to learn about yourself. You mm -hmm. have to learn about the world around you. You have to learn about your own limitations. You have to learn how others see you. And that work is really uncomfortable. Why do you think it's worthwhile for people to face the discomfort in order to learn and grow? It's the only way you're going to be teachable. And I think with anything where there's, um, you know, a podium in front of you or you're uh, wearing the hat of a mentor, instructor, and sometimes even a coach, and you do it for a long time, you could start to not be teachable. <laughs> you know, you could start to believe that uh, you have all the answers. And uh, I think you become less less powerful of a, of a catalyst. So self-awareness, I think, is step one, being aware. And it makes you elastic. It makes you flexible. It makes you curious. And it makes you teachable. So you can yeah. teach others. Yeah. So I just want to shout out right now. I love that, John, you had the sensible answers to that question. <laughs> because when I came up with the answers to that question of why is learning and growth important to an adult? What I wrote down for our script was that we're going to die anyway, and there are aliens mm -hmm. here now. I love it. I, we need that kind of thing. We need both. You know, we can't just have my answer. So, uh, and it's true. We are going to die. Life is very short, and the aliens thing is happening. So, yeah, it is. Yeah, and and just kind of from that perspective, is like, what do you have to lose? Mm -hmm. You know, all of us have these secret desires that we keep hidden and all of us have a soul and a life force and that in that life force seems to flow through really all living beings and you know we sit in our houses and we watch television through these weird boxes and we talk to other people through these other weird boxes and our phones and i posit what's the point what are we doing mm -hmm. if we're not yeah. growing and evolving yeah i love it i love how blunt that is yeah well i mean that's that's the choice is evolve or perish, I think, in our time. Mm -hmm. So how do we do this from, from a coaching perspective? And especially knowing how hard this is for our clients when they come to the space of coaching and they're ready, they want to make these changes, they want to take these steps, they want to become different versions of themselves. What do we need to understand about humans and the human condition? so that we can work with folks ethically and compassionately? I would say for me, it's always uh, making sure the soil is rich. And by what I mean by that is um, creating a safe space, coming in empathetic, coming in wide, coming in curious about one story instead of coming in saying, here's what you need to do. Yeah, absolutely. And alongside of that, we need to understand that emotions are part of that party. Mm -hmm. Emotions are part of that process. When somebody comes into the space of, um, of learning and change, we need to know that, that they're going to have feelings about the right. past, right. Uh, about the present, and about the future. And one of the things that usually comes up for folks when they're really in a place where they need to face change is regret. Mm. over what they've done and what they didn't do. And that's really common in a coaching context. And that's, I think, one of the hardest emotions to sit with as a coach because we're so conditioned to move to action as coaches. We want our clients to put their shame aside and get on with the action steps because that's how we know how to do our jobs but we're missing a, a step of the process if we don't recognize that part of the learning that needs to take place is both how we feel and also how we want to feel. Yes. And also uh, sometimes us being uncomfortable with someone else's emotion. So trying to provide solutions, hence making it about us instead of allowing the person to just be allowing the person to just feel. And that's what I mean by safety and soil and creating safe space. If your client has emotions, you're not trying to patch them up. You're allowing them to feel, you know, that doesn't mean that you're uh, being a therapist. It doesn't. It doesn't. And, you know, our emotions are designed to give us messages. And so that's something that I often like to ask my clients is, well, what message did that emotion give you? 
mm. and to see where where that might lead. Have you ever had an emotion that you were able to identify? I was like, oh, this is giving me a message. Yeah, for sure. Sometimes I could be pouty in just in my life in general, but being curious about the poutiness and following that thread down. Oh, it came from here. It's connecting dots in my story. So not just like shaming myself for being pouty or snapping myself as, you know, a child immature, but being curious about where these emotions are coming from because the emotion that's felt is truth, but it doesn't, you know, the meaning we place on the emotion is probably not true. So, yeah. So kind of uh, processing that in my own way, taking a beat, being curious about where the emotions are coming from and also validating it, like letting myself, you know, if I need to be pouty, okay, be pouty. Yeah. Yeah. And 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 that comes with a dose of compassion. You know, mm-hmm. mirroring that for a coaching conversation, it's like, you know, I'm sorry that you feel that way. And let's see if we want to redefine your relationship with that feeling. I had a really powerful coaching intervention recently. I was working with my coach and we were setting up all of the goals for 2023. And I was feeling overwhelmed and intimidated. And she asked me what my relationship was like with ambition. And for me, in that moment, at the beginning of the year in January, I had a really negative reaction. I had a really negative emotional reaction to the Mm -hmm. word ambition. And my coach asked me to really get underneath that response and underneath that reaction to figure out, you know, what my emotional response was. And it came from worthiness, interestingly, was that, you know, people from the outside looking in would say, wow, Noelle's a pretty ambitious person. And I am. But my dial was turned to martyrdom, where I couldn't name it as ambition because I was doing this for other people. I was building on the behalf of other people. And it wasn't until... I redirected that emotional set and turned my dial to myself and said, you know what? What I'm building is worthy. My work is worthy. I am worthy of ambition. Yeah. Yeah. And it just opened up, opened up for me. I love how conversations can happen via something so simple, like how a word made you feel. And I think one of the misconceptions about about coaching, uh, if you're new at this, is you're like, what's the maze I have to put my client into? What are the, you know, the most powerful open-ended questions that I can ask? And you're really kind of like, you know, swinging for the stars, swinging for the fences. But even something like this can be more powerful, which is how the word ambition makes you feel. And then, you know, running through that conversation and coming to your, your revelation. How does the word ambition make you feel? Oh, man. Always turning it back on me. So this is actually, um, it's current. It's currently happening in my life. As you know, I'm, I'm doing my first festival based off my, my book, Sing On Purpose. And it's terrifying. And it's, it's very different than, you know, running a retreat or doing some kind of online thing. I'm trying to get, you know, 500 people <laughs> over, over in the uh, 20 minute, minutes away from Vegas. And I'm scared. This is the first time in my life, I think I need to be scared uh, that I'm actually scared about because, you know, I'm the whole like build the bus while you're driving it. This is the first time in my life, probably in the last, I don't know, seven, eight years that I've actually been kind of scared. And so ambition, how does that land for me? Oh, I'm scared of it. I'm scared of ambition. I'm scared I'm not going to be able to bring people there, give them a good experience. I'm scared that it does. this doesn't work out, then what that says about me and also what I've been doing for the last 10 years and you know, all of that. So lots of jitters, lots of butterflies, lots of fears. Mm. Would you like to hear a coaching technique that that I use to handle fears and pain like that? Yeah, absolutely. So fully acknowledging that all of your feelings suck, like they're not fun feelings to have, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When you think about, number one, what you're going to accomplish with bringing people together in this way, and number two, and here's the really important part, what you think about what you're going to learn about yourself, about others, about this process, about how to run a festival, how does that stack up in terms of worthiness? I mean, it's gold. It's uh, going back to the title of this episode, you know, learning, 
right? How do you learn and grow and, and you know, as an, as a change as an adult? Yes. I mean, if I focus not on can I get X amount of tickets sold or people there, but more on what am I going to learn through this and, and what a gift it is to have the opportunity to even ride this roller coaster. Yeah, that changes things in that that means that the value is already baked in as long as you're open. As long as you're open. Exactly. Yeah. 100%. And this is a wonderful technique for clients too, because when we're in the middle of hard things, it sucks. Yeah. <laughs> it does. Yeah. That's real. And we don't want to minimize those feelings or redirect them. But we do want to understand that in the middle of those feelings, we're going to get something really good for the price mm-hmm. of admission. Yeah. I will keep uh, holding on to that. We'll see. Yeah. The second piece of learning that needs to be taken into an account for adults. So step one is, is understanding the emotional sets. And then step two is understanding our behaviors and how our behaviors show up. Because the combination of emotions and behaviors is essentially the compass that we set our paths on. Mm -hmm. How do you help clients understand their behaviors? Or how do you understand your own or others' behaviors? I think first, looking at our behaviors uh, from a little bit of distance, right? So um, Mm -hmm. pulling yourself out of emotion and uh, really being able to look at the pattern of your behaviors as information. Behavior is how we change. So what are you doing or what are you not doing and why? Yeah, something that's really interesting about behavior is that it's more about the whole person then I think a lot of people realize our our behaviors actually include the past, the present, and the future. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. there is a cognitive element and even a spiritual element that yeah. behind, underneath, and around what we do and say. So what people do and say is the outcome that we see. From a coaching perspective, what we have to understand and get underneath is all of those other layers. You know, what does somebody believe? What is their past experience? What is their present experience? What do they want for their future? You know, how do they see the world from a cognitive perspective? And even from a a spiritual perspective could be very important for some people to actually explain what's behind some of their behaviors, if they're able to generate that level of self-awareness. I love where you're going with this because you're right. And I agree that behavior, because I see behavior as kind of the ripple from something else, right? And what you're talking about is either underneath or above spiritual. And I think that's really where the um, life-changing conversations happen is not just like, oh, you're eating a bag of Doritos at night. Okay, how can we, okay, we'll stop doing that or whatever. Why? But um, where is that coming from? And if you kind of go to the source, then the behavior will change because you're going to the source, right? Yes. And this is so important to hit on for coaching mastery, because what's not happening in this conversation is moving from behavior to solution. So I'm eating a bag of Doritos every night. I need to stop doing that behavior. So when we move right to solution, we're robbing ourselves of the opportunity for deeper context. Right. And I I think this is one of the mistakes that early that baby coaches make because they feel like they need to to provide a solution. And of course you can, but there is a beat. And this is the, if you skip this beat, then yes, it's very surfacey instead of the opportunity to go deeper. And going deeper is intimidating. You know, let's level set. Of course. It is. I mean, getting into the spiritual dynamics of a bag of Doritos is not for the faint of heart. (laughs) Right. Right. (laughs) <laughs> it's not. You know why? Because it's vast and there's no map. And so that's terrifying for someone who is uh, swimming in the ocean and wants, you know, the buoys and knows where they're going, you know. And so just, okay, there's the ocean. There's space. There's Which space. Which way do we go? Yeah. And it's, it's swimming in that space that's such hard work because yeah. our behaviors are so ingrained that they often run off of, of a subconscious script. Mm -hmm. And so when we, as coaches, push accountability and awareness into the mix, that's when our clients start to get really uncomfortable 
And from a, a strategic perspective with coaching, this is also the place in a coaching relationship where, in my experience, people repeat and repeat and repeat week after week and month after month. This part of the change process of identifying the behavior, understanding the psychological, mental, emotional, spiritual root, and then actually moving towards behavioral change takes a really long time. Yeah, it's not one session, you know. Um, no. You can definitely have insight and revelations, but yeah, it's a whole process, it's a whole journey. And I want to prepare young coaches out there for the fact that, you know, you may have three to 25 sessions on the same topic. You're just looking at it from a different angle, a different place on the change spiral as your client evolves. But that behavior, because it's so deeply ingrained and so tied to past, present, future, emotional, socio-emotional, and spiritual, it's going to take a minute. Yeah. So change is not born of ahas and breakthroughs. And learning and awareness is not sufficient to sustain change. Oh, change is not born in the, the aha moments. And what you said, well, learning change is not sufficient. Yeah, for, for learning what? and awareness is not sufficient to sustain change. So mm, we, we can have change. the ahas yeah. and the breakthroughs, and then we can have that awareness and that learning, but that's not actually what right. brings us change. It, it is the tip of the iceberg. And what actually creates change is the iceberg of repetition, mm -hmm. of catching yourself, of reinforcing, of screwing up, of going back to basics, of feeling like a failure, getting back up again, trying again. And it is only in the commitment to repetition and in the consistent repetition that someone is able to change. Awareness and learning comes first, and then consistent repetition must follow. Yes, breaking of patterns. Yeah, I mean, what you're saying is uh, we could have revelations and talk about your life all day. But if you do nothing, there is no repetition, but just if you're just having conversations, yeah, there's going to be no change. There might be some internal inside change, but your life outside is not going to change if you're doing the same thing. Yeah. And, you know, another piece that really has to be taken into consideration for our clients is that when our clients go out into the world and they start doing this work, they start changing their behavior, their entire environment is going to react to that change and they're going to have to force their way into their current environment with their new behaviors. Boundary work is a great example of this. A lot of times when people start enforcing boundaries for the first time, everyone around them freaks out. Right. What's an example, or can you think of a time when you had an idea in your head of how change was going to go from you? For you, how change was going to go for you, and then the world around you didn't respond in exactly the way you thought. Yeah. Oh man, I think my early days of what I thought I wanted, what a therapist looked like, and then when I went and pursued it, the universe had different plans, throwing me into nonprofit. So that was the was the first time in my life where my reality didn't look like what I what I wanted, which because I wanted was a you know office and, and slacks and all that. But the universe threw me into uh, uniforms and grocery shopping and working with teenagers. And so yeah, that was probably the first time that um, what I wanted didn't match what the universe had for me. You know what mine is when I decided I was going to become a coach. Mm, right. And to give you know context. Um, I was young. I was just about to get divorced. This was a very long time ago and coaching wasn't as established as it is now. And I knew for certain that positive psychology and coaching changed my life and would change the lives of others. And my dad <laughs> told me that that wasn't a real thing and yeah. I'd never make a living. The university where I worked at the time, let me run my workshops on coaching, but wouldn't let me get involved in actually any strategic initiatives 
as an administrator at that university. And then I remember my freaking divorce attorney telling me that I was never going to make it as a coach and I should accept alimony. I like I was like 29 and I was like, wow, everyone, it's like, you really don't believe in this, huh? Yeah. That, and it wasn't even that long ago, you know? I mean, 29 was a long time ago. Let's be. I mean, like if you, if you look at the, uh, if you look at kind of like, you know, the whole span of this field, but I had the same experience in that when I was leaving my couple's therapist and I was probably early thirties and uh, before I became a therapist, I told him, you know, I want to do what you're doing. And he's like, what what do you think you're going to like becoming a therapist? Well, how much money do you think you're going to make? And I said, I would be happy if I, if I just had a practice and I made six figures. And he said to me, John, you're never going to make six figures as a therapist. Um, obviously, obviously projecting, you know, his, his inability to make six figures. But I remember leaving the office, like, why did he tell me that? And what, and what, like, I remember just being puzzled that he directly just said to me, John, you're never going, you know, he was in his fifties. He said, you're never going to be, uh, make six figures as a therapist. I'll tell you right now. So I got the same thing. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and to everybody else out there who has had the experience of somebody saying to you, you're never going to yeah. X, Y, Z. I'm sorry. It's coming from their own story. Yeah. And that is one of the most dangerous and profound things to say to someone. Because depending on how you respond to that, it's either a shutdown or an invitation. Yeah. Maybe he thought he was trying to prevent me from something. I don't know. But yeah, who knows? I, I remember that. You know, people are people are weird and they say weird shit, which is, you know, one of the reasons why we're in business. It's part and parcel. So the last piece that I want to close out with around learning as an adult is the fact that we touched on, but there's a, a true formula for is that learning and performance are two different things. Mm. And let me explain what I, I mean by that. So we talked about somebody engaging in behavioral change like boundary work and it going not great when they start to move into their real life. When we're talking about learning and performance, quote unquote, performance means that you're taking that learning and you're able to apply it in lots of different contexts. Mm -hmm. And that's really hard to do. So somebody's starting with boundary work. They might start with their friend group or they might start at home. They might build up to doing it at work. They might build up to doing it, you know, at the gym until they're able to take this one piece of learning and this one skill and move it around all different contexts. And mm. that's hard. It's hard to do and it's hard to do without support and accountability. Have you ever had an experience where you had to do that with something in your own life? Well, you know, I think about relationships and how kind of everything you change one thing about the the way that you love or uh, a definition of love or or something and how it how it ripples not only into your your intimate relationship but probably into friendships and family. So, I feel like they're not um th these kind of contained single serving things change in that way always spreads into other areas and so that I noticed that, you know. Yeah. Oh, I can relate to that big time. Yeah. That's happened for me, you know, in my own life. And I think that was something that happened in my divorce, too. I remember that being like it was a big deal in my home. It was a big deal in my friend group. It was a big mm -hmm. deal in my, you know, my my family, my place of work. Even it was kind of whispered like, oh, Noelle's getting a divorce. And I'm like, right. Yes. And I'm becoming a coach, too, everyone. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. that, that, but it's not a real thing. That, it's what are you talking about? Yeah. Right. So. The formula that we really want to work with with folks is so it has has a few steps and their their insight, motivation, that person's capability is actually sandwiched in the middle there, real world practice and then accountability. So let me explain these. So insight is the extent to which a person understands what needs to be changed or developed. And that's where learning comes in. It's step one in the process. Their motivation is the bridge between learning and performance. That's where they understand the extent to which they really need to make the change. And folks often and coaches often get the two confused that if someone says, 
I see this. It's my fault. I know I need to do it. That's really different from actually having internalized motivation around why mm-hmm. and what's at stake if it doesn't happen and the, the actual motivation to, to move forward in a constructive way. And then the third piece that a coach has to check in on is, does this person have the knowledge and the skills to accomplish their goals? Yeah. And this is another piece that's often mistaken for learning. It is and it isn't. So when we're talking about the capability and skills, these are what are considered leveraged and sub goals within the main goal. So the learning takes place first, then we source for motivation. Then we source, does everybody have what they need to get this shit done? And then from there, we move on to real world practice because nothing will move forward unless the client has the opportunity to practice in the real world. And then finally, there needs to be accountability. Yeah, accountability for sure. And, you know, that's something as a coach that I think everyone can do. You can do it in your own way is, you know, help make someone be, uh, be accountable. Absolutely. And a friends, family, you know, even sharing that which you want to accomplish out loud with others is a fantastic way to drive personal accountability. Yeah. Well, my friend. I love Thank being you. on this journey of learning with you. Yeah. And it's uh, it's forever. It's for the rest of, well, I mean, that's the way I look. It's for the rest of my life. So uh, becoming an adult, change and grow. Indeed, indeed. Thank you for listening, everyone. Be well. Take care. Have a great day. Thanks for listening to Everything Life Coaching. If you're feeling the draw to become a coach, head to lumiacoaching.com slash everything. Explore a new career that brings fulfillment, gives you a true sense of purpose, and a bold community to do it with. Lumia is ready to equip you with the tools, training, and community you will need to reach your goals. If you're ready to build a unique coaching business on your own terms while making an impact on the world at large, Lumia is the next bold step in your coaching journey. That's lumiacoaching.com slash everything. And hey, if you're waiting for a sign, this is it.